So Bill, 2019, we had a 22 minute gap after the end of the race and the winner being determined. In 2020, we had the pandemic. 2021, we waited a long time to figure out who the winner of the Derby was. It has been three bizarre derbies in a row. Are you finally ready for one that maybe can start and finish more normally? Well, this is gonna be my 17th Derby. So fortunately I had the first 13 or so <laughs> that, that went pretty smoothly. So we've had a bit of a rough stretch. Uh, we're looking forward to everything getting back to normal and it looks like everything is. It's, uh, I've never seen such excitement and such energy going into to the big day. So it feels good. I'm an opti optimistic person by nature. Our, I think our team tends to be that way. So we're fired up, we're ready to go. The past is the past. We're just focused on, we're just focused on 2022. How surprised are you at the volume of customers, fans who you see coming back for the Derby, given the uncertainty that was 2020 and 2021? When the pandemic started, we really didn't know if it was gonna change America forever. And, and so it's great to be really on the other side of it being COVID being categorized as a pandemic. And what we're finding with respect to our customers and our facility is people are coming back. They're coming back in droves and they're excited. And the energy really around the Derby, especially in this region of the country is, is more like a holiday. It's more like a festival. So it, it's great to see people embrace that. You, you think they're going to, but you never know until the time comes. But, um, but for us, it's all systems go. It feels really good. And, uh, and it's really exciting. It's fun. It's fun to it's fun to be a part of it. A lot of the conversation around Bob Baffert and last year's Derby, uh, the Kentucky Horse Racing Commission has had their say as well. And there's a suspension in place, right. but Churchill Downs jumped ahead of that with a two-year ban for Baffert. Why did Churchill Downs feel that it was necessary to get ahead of the KHRC and take that move? Yeah, fair question. When you race at Churchill Downs, it's a privilege. It's not a right. You sign. Uh, terms and conditions for for access to our races for access to stalls for your horses so you make a commitment to us regarding how you're going to behave so with all due respect to the regulatory process we had our eye on that we watched that very very closely but the results were in and uh, the horse had a banned medication in its system and we need to respond to that we we race every day during our meet um, and every, every day that we do race, we have to ensure the, the safety of the horses, the safety of the jockeys, the integrity of the product. We can't wait for a, a multi-month uh, process. We have to act to protect the whole. We have to act to protect the people that go out there every day and take risk to ride those horses. We have a profound obligation to protect those animals. We have a, an obligation to ensure to our guests, to our fans, to the betters, that the product is being run with integrity and transparency. Mm -hmm. So we can't wait around for a long, long process of appeals when it's clear from the results that there's an issue with respect to a banned substance. So that's why we acted quickly. Uh, that's the appropriate way to go. I think the process has borne out our initial, our initial actions. Um, so that's, that's how we think about it. That's how we approach it. It's, it's a much larger obligation than just to an individual. It's an obligation to, to a, uh, the sport, to, to our fans, to the betters, to our guests. Two years is a significant ban. We've had other trainers have violations that haven't carried that severe ban. How much did a positive test from a 2020 race, the Kentucky Oaks, on top of the 21 Derby, impact the length of the Baffert suspension? Is the totality of the circumstance. We haven't had a, a drug failure since 1968 uh, in the Kentucky Derby. So uh, the fact that Bob um, had the positive in the Derby was a pretty profound issue, problem mm -hmm. um, for, for all of us. But to top that off, he, he had a drug positive for the exact same substance the year before in our other major race, the Kentucky Oaks, the, the championship race for the three-year-old Phillies. Mm -hmm. um, that just meant to us that um, he hadn't taken accountability, he hadn't taken responsibility for his actions, the exact same substance. Um, we really needed to take strong action to ensure for all of those folks out there that, that rely on our reputation um, and the sports reputation for delivering a transparent product and a product with integrity, 
that we were actually doing so and that we were addressing problems when we found them. We, we can never guarantee that someone won't try to cheat, that someone won't break the rules. We can't guarantee that that, that will never happen. What's important is how do we respond when it does happen? And in this case, we had a person that, uh, that did, did the same thing two times in a row, and clearly that demonstrates that he hadn't learned his lesson, that he hadn't taken responsibility, and we needed to make sure that, that he understood the consequences. Since leaving the winner's circle at the Derby, have you spoken with Bob at all? Nope, I guess I, guess I haven't, and that's not unusual. You know, my relationship with, with trainers who run their horses in the Derby is exactly that. They're trainers that have entered horses in the Derby, and I'm the CEO of the company. Right. That ultimately is what our relationship is. My obligation is to this institution and to our, our shareholders, to the sport, and so that's not necessarily uncommon, especially for a California-based trainer when we're based here in Kentucky. He actually doesn't run much here outside of Derby, Derby Week. What, if any, is his path to coming back to Churchill Downs as a trainer to race in the biggest races of the year? He's got to complete a suspension, and he has to behave during that suspension. It doesn't appear to be the case that that, that suspension will be something that every jurisdiction enforces to that period of time. We are not a regulatory authority, we're a private enterprise. So most states are recognizing the 90-day suspension that he's been given by the Kentucky Horse Racing Commission, but he still has international opportunities and other opportunities. So certainly it's the case that we'll be watching uh, his behavior in those races, and, and certainly, uh, certainly we hope that there aren't further drug violations, and certainly we'll be paying attention if there are. But let's say there aren't, and he completes his two-year suspension, well, then he's completed his suspension. And, and then, uh, absent further facts, he should be free to, to race again here if he chooses. This is no disrespect to many of the great tracks around the country, like Saratoga, Santa Anita, but you, you sit in a unique spot because of the large impact of the Derby and all the eyes that are on Churchill Downs. Ask folks to name a racetrack, usually they'll spit out Churchill Downs right away. Does that put the actions that you take in cases, this one or cases like this, in a more significant light for sending a message to the sport of how this sport needs to handle its business going forward? I think no greater pressure than, or responsibility than we already feel to the institution. I, I, think, uh, I think we want to hold ourselves to the highest standards. We are so appreciative of our role in the horse racing industry, our role in the state of Kentucky, and we take that very, very seriously. So I think that in and of itself um, is something we never forget and we talk about constantly when we have a situation like this. You know, what is, let's, let's forget the hubris, let's focus on the facts, let's focus on the circumstances and let's make choices that are the right choices, understanding that there's always gonna be lots of voices out there saying whatever they're gonna say. What's the right thing to do? What's the consistent thing to do with our rules and policies and processes that everybody who races here understands? So. Sometimes I think there can be a, a thought that you pull back to this holistic, broad level, mm -hmm. but ultimately it starts with, hey, what are the rules? How do the rules work? Uh, are they understood? Have they been accepted uh, um, by the people participating in our races? Mm -hmm. Let's just focus on what the facts are and what the rules are and the clarity of the rules, and let's start there. Let me get a legal update from this week. On Monday, the day of the Derby draw, Churchill Downs filed a motion to have the lawsuit that's sitting out there dismissed, the Baffert lawsuit. Why do you guys feel at this point that you're in the right regarding that legal filing? Uh, well, Mr. Baffert has followed a path of sort of mass litigation, mass appeal, and he's been unsuccessful at every turn. So he had filed it with respect to us, a preliminary injunction that was denied. And it's just time. It's just, uh, he's pursuing every appeal that he can. He's getting the same result and the same answer every time. We think his lawsuit is completely frivolous and let's just get on with it. So uh, we didn't want to be a distraction. We let him run his process. We let him file his preliminary injunction. He did that, he got the result. The, lawsu the lawsuit's still out there. So from our perspective, Mike, our, our, our view is let's just get on with it. We, we think it's frivolous. Let's just get it dismissed if uh, it's time for the court to consider that. Bigger picture question. Mm -hmm. 
related to this, we've seen other states say, okay, we'll honor this 90-day suspension from the Kentucky Horse Racing Commission. And we've been down this road with a variety of trainers over a variety of issues. Are we any closer to getting some national leadership in this sport that can help make a decision that a Roger Goodell or a Gary Bettman or a Bob Manfred would in their sports that would have a national impact as opposed to this uh, geographic hodgepodge, if you will? Well, we are. We've got the Horse Racing Integrity Act that was passed by, by Congress and is being implemented now. So I think that's a great start for our sport. Um, one of the best things about our sport is the, tr the tradition, the history of the sport. But the reality is because of that, it grew up in a balkanized state-by-state -state mm -hmm. process. Um, so every state has its own regulatory infrastructure, every state has its own rules, and there's a lot of similarity in terms of what the rules actually are, but the level of enforcement, the quality of regulatory authority, and the quality of regulatory re uh, review can be different between different jurisdictions. So the best answer long-term for our game is a national approach where the rules are uniform, where the enforcement is uniform, where the standards are uniform. So we're down that path. The law has been passed. Uh, HISA or HISA, depending on how you want to pronounce it, it's underway. They've taken the first couple steps. Um, they're developing their protocols. And pretty soon we'll get to the implementation of those protocols, which we're big fans of. We think that's a good idea. We think that will level the playing field across different states. and eliminate any hubris around differences between jurisdictions, which didn't have any impact in the Baffert situation. But for trainers that are moving state to state, mm -hmm. and every state's a little bit different, it just creates a lot of noise and confusion that, that doesn't, doesn't make uh, for the best process. I'm fascinated about wagering in sports because if we sat down four years ago, sports wagering was only legal in one state, Nevada. Now it's over 30 states, and there are more that are leaning in that direction. What kind of an impact has that had on wagering in the sport of horse racing? Horse racing's always had an advantage compared to the other sports. Because of our history, there's, always, there's been in place a long time a federal law that made national wagering on horse racing legal so long as the states involved mm -hmm. thought it were legal and most states did think it uh, did pass laws making it legal so we've had an advantage for a long time and now with sports wagering on other sports coming into these different jurisdictions we'll have to see long term how it's going to impact wagering on horse racing but we actually think it's a great opportunity for our sport because right now, for somebody to be interested in wagering on horse racing, they have to be so interested that they go to a site that is solely devoted and focused on horse racing. Mm -hmm. In the future, I think it'll be the case that folks that are more casually interested can find our sport on whatever major national platform they're on, which they may have joined because they want to bet on the Red Sox or the Yankees or what have you. They'll be able to more easily access our sport. And so for us, uh, opening the doors, broadening, broadening the availability of sports wagering, we think that's ultimately really good for our sport because we don't have to just rely on the appeal solely of our sport to get customers to sign up to wager. So in a couple of years, you can see a betting world where if I'm going to go make a bet on an NFL game, oh, by the way, a couple of clicks away, here's horse racing, and right. that might bring more people to the sport. Yeah, it should. And you mentioned a moment ago you're fascinated by wagering. I've been involved from the business side with, with wagering on horse racing and, and sports wagering for a long time. As a game, sports, uh, as a game, wagering on horse racing is a really good game. It's a really quality uh, gambling product. So uh, a lot of, a lot of uh, gamblers on sports ultimately enjoy the sport itself, but also enjoy the puzzle of wagering on it. Mm -hmm. And horse racing is a great, great puzzle. So <laughs> as it becomes more familiar to a broader uh, reach of Americans, that's really good for us. That's clearly a really good thing for us. I'll have to remember that next time I'm looking at the form. It's a puzzle. <laughs> it's a puzzle. It's not, there's not always an easy answer or any kind of answer that's to the puzzle. But if you want hints on how to solve that puzzle, I can give you about 10 different opinions to the same question from 10 different people. So it may not help you, but somebody's going to be right. That's so. true. That's true.
there are so many traditions at the Derby, and one of them is my old Kentucky home, that song that is played. And in recent years, there's been a continued realization of some of the roots of that song in the slavery movement, and some have voiced their objections to it. And now there's a book that's been written by that title that was reviewed this week in the Washington Post and the New York Times. Where does the track stand on the playing of that song and its significance within this world where we're examining things with a, maybe a different light than we did 10, 15 years ago? Yeah, really fair question. And when you're, when you're part of a company that's 148 years old, uh, things like this are going to happen over time. The, the, the country changes, uh, things change. With respect to the song, here's how we look at it. it it's the state song of Kentucky. Um, it's been sung at the Kentucky Derby for at least the last 100 years. Many of our guests say it's the single most important moment. It's a moment of reflection. It's a moment of connection. And so we have to balance that with with, with other voices. And, and this is one of those circumstances, it's sort of like uh, what your mother tells you when you're a small boy. You can't make everybody happy. You just can't weave through, uh, you, just, you just can't cut through this in a way that makes everybody happy. Mm -hmm. So ultimately you have to do what you think is the right thing to do. So we've studied the voices uh, that, that we hear. We've, we've studied their points, I should say. We've reviewed this carefully. We've, we've, we've talked to the people in the government. We've talked to the people in the community. We, we've really put our heart and soul into figuring out, well, what is the right thing to do in 2022? And we've come out at this point in time saying, we need to sing the song. We're not gonna make everybody happy, but the, the totality of, of the voices, the totality of the data that we've looked at and reviewed on this, just has led us to the conclusion that we think the right thing to do is to keep playing the song. So that's what we're gonna do, uh, but that doesn't mean we don't respect and that we don't hear these other voices. We hear everybody's voice. And what we, do you say to the dissenting voices? I'd say uh, we, 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 too, we truly respect your uh, feeling, your opinion, and we have to balance that against everybody's opinions. and. We can't find an answer that makes everybody happy, and we have to do what we think is right. And our review of the totality of these facts and these circumstances say it's the right thing to do to play the song. If that, over time, changes as the country changes, that's not something I can predict. But I really do think, based on everything we've learned, all the work we've, we've done on this, all the discussion we've had, this is the right thing to do, and the bulk of our customers ag agree with this. I think the bulk of this, the state and the community ag agrees with this. I wouldn't say that this is a media issue. It, it isn't just a media issue. It's much bigger than that. There are voices out there who feel very strongly and have very strong opinions about issues like this and other things. And we have to just do our, the best we can to listen to those voices and balance them with all of the voices to make, try to make the best decision that we're convinced is the right decision for the moment. Lastly, this place. It's one of the iconic sports venues in America. And there's always that fine line of retaining what it's about, yet expanding it for years and generations to come. Yeah. There are so many projects going on here right now. Uh, can you just capsulize what is going on with the growth of Churchill Downs and what this place is going to look like, maybe not just next year, but in two years for the 150th Kentucky Derby in 2024? I often feel like uh, the luckiest guy ever with respect to my business career because I came here at a really good time and it's been 17 years. Um, but this company is 148 years old, so you would think, well, that's an old company, especially by American standards. But in a lot of ways, it's brand new. And we've diversified, we've expanded, we've gotten into casino gaming, we've gotten into online wagering, and all those things have been really successful for us. And it's created a really great balance sheet and a really great skill set. And we've taken a lot of that and we've turned that back towards our core. You know, what, what are we most known for? What's the best thing about our company? What's the crown jewel? And it, it's always going to be the Kentucky Derby and Churchill Downs Racetrack. So we've, we've really utilized and leveraged all the skills and the capital strength that, that we've developed from our other activities. And we've invested some of that back in here. So you're, you're, you're here today at a, at a track that's 148 years old, but it's largely being rebuilt. And, 
And I think ultimately that is the legacy of the company. Uh, a lot's changed in the world over the last 148 years, yet we've stayed relevant, we stayed fresh, and that's because we invest. So right now we have three major capital projects going on. It's going to culminate with the 150th Kentucky Derby in two years, 2024, where we're going to rebuild almost to the point where it's not recognizable the paddock of, of, the, uh, of the track. So you can see the Twin Spires, which is our most important, iconic architectural signature. But by the way, even though we've been here since 1875, the Twin Spires were built in 1895. So it just shows new things work well here, although it's not so new anymore, but it was new in 1895. But we're gonna rebuild that whole area to focus on the Twin Spires, and we're gonna go vertical around the paddock. Right now, the, the, the paddock is horizontal, so we're gonna build seating and hospitality that really focus the energy of people as they come here on that place where the horses are, where they're being saddled, where the jockeys are mounting the horses, where they're yelling riders up, where the, where the people are speculating on which horses they like, and where you can see all the, uh, all, all the pretty guys and the pretty girls who are, are dressed to the nines for, for a big day of racing. We look forward to 2024, and we look forward to this weekend. Thank you, Bill. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate it.